Welcome back to the news round. If you're listening to the mining pod, Matt Kimmel is off today. We're going to go through a bunch of different stories from this week. There was a lot of stories in Bitcoin mining and uh, adjacent to the industry. So we will go through them all, of course. First, we're going to start off with Bitcoin mining revenues in May, which hit a new high for the year. Then we'll go over to US Bitcoin and its deal with the Fahrenheit Group to manage Celsius mining's uh, ASICs. Then we'll go over to CoreWeave, which just raised a lot of money to do AI, pivoting out ETH mining into AI. The last two stories for today, we're going to be talking about Tether, which is now mining Bitcoin Uruguay after its announcement of purchasing Bitcoin onto its balance sheet. And then we'll go over to the Biden administration's 30% Dame tax failing. Lastly, finishing up with a little shitcoin cry corner talking about the Ethereum problem with liquid staking. Should be a pretty interesting note if you're into following up on Ethereum stories, pretty complex subject there, but we will get into it. Okay, let's jump into the first part here. Bitcoin miner revenue climbs to $916 million in May. That's according to the Blocks Research Dashboards. Of course, this is taking into consideration the Coinbase fee or the Coinbase subsidy and the transaction fees. So you can see from this nice chart here, uh, all time, we're still lower, about 50% where we were during the top of the bull market. But year to date, we're at an all time high, which is fantastic. So just under that $1 billion mark for Bitcoin mining revenues over the month. Of course, during the bull market, we saw most months way well over $1 billion, which allowed a lot of these miners to grow so fantastically. Uh, since then, we've had pretty low monthly revenues, around $500 million. It's been increasing on two facts. One, the rise, the price of Bitcoin rising to about $30,000, gone down to about $25,000 since. And then, of course, inscriptions and ordinals, uh, adding a lot of transaction fees to Bitcoin miners. You can see this chart here as well. Bitcoin mining transaction count has grown to about 16.3 and uh, denominated in Bitcoin for the month of April. So that is great for the industry, of course. We'll leave that story there. I'm sure a lot of Bitcoin miners are enjoying the excess revenues. Okay, let's go to our next story for the day. We're going to talk about US Bitcoin teaming up with the Fahrenheit Group in order to take over Celsius Mining's books. US Bitcoin is working in uh, collaboration with a few other groups under the Fahrenheit team, uh, Arrington Capital, a few other names are involved with this. Basically, they're taking over the assets on the books of Celsius and also the mining industry part of this, which is for our purposes more important. So they have about 4.3 exahash as of now. US Bitcoin will be managing these ASICs and they'll also be developing some sites on behalf of the Fahrenheit group. Uh, they'll be getting a lot of different, uh, they'll be getting a lot of money from Fahrenheit in order to operate uh, these units. Reading here from the Coindesk article, quote, under the Celsius deal, US Bitcoin will enter into one or more operating and services agreements to be the exclusive operator of the Celsius mining fleet. On top of that, US Bitcoin will receive a $15 million annual management fee for the mining assets, net of operating expenses for the first five years it will manage the rigs. There's going to be some other things in here as well. There's like an option to purchase some of US Bitcoin's operating sites, such as one in New York. Uh, but for the most part, the thing here is that US Bitcoin will have a hash rate under management larger than any miner currently in operation once this is all set up. Now, this is still pending. There's still things going on during like this whole process. But according to hash rate indexes on numbers, which took a look, uh, in-depth look at this, there's going to have about 27.2 exahash under management. Uh, of course, they'll be have most of that in terms of hosting. So it's not self-mining like the other miners out there. But it's still a lot of management fees and the ability to grow along with it. They'll still be a top five miner in terms of self mining once this is all complete as well. So definitely a story to watch. Hopefully we'll have some interviews on the mining pod about this arrangement in the near future. Okay, next we're going to go over to CoreWeave and talk about the AI pivot from Ethereum mining to AI. Of course, this has been like a long touted subject. Uh, a lot of these Ethereum miners from back in the day when there still was Ethereum mining before the merge in September 2022 talked about how eventually they wanted to move to AI and rendering and other things of that nature with their expensive GPUs. A lot of people didn't believe this was going to happen. And we even talked about it on the mining pod a few times with a few miners talking about how this was unlikely to occur because AI was always sort of out there and rendering uh kind of a weird industry to work into because sometimes you'll have a job, sometimes you won't have a job. And so modeling out the revenue projections for these GPUs can be very difficult. But since OpenAI and ChatGPT and ChatGPT4 and all those things start popping up on the timeline, I've come out, there's been a huge push for these Bitcoin miners and others in the adjacent space to move into this. 
Corwood is capitalizing on top of that with a $200 million raise, bringing a total funding round of $421 million in order to fully pivot and move towards AI. They're one of the few Ethereum miners who have seemingly stuck this landing, but there are some other firms working on this and speaking about it actively. From the public side of things, we know that with Hive and Hut8, which are both aggressively pursuing uh, high performance computing, uh, they're sort of moving toward the edge of these markets, right? Where you just need high performance compute, uh, maybe in a city just for like that extensive margin not necessarily like the Googles or the Amazons or the Microsofts where they have dedicated large facilities. CoreWeave may be pursuing that model uh, along with like the Microsofts, uh, but for most part, a lot of these other Bitcoin miners that are also working in the AI scene, they're sort of doing it on the margin and maybe over time they'll grow to a larger part of their portfolio. So I spoke a little bit about that, this whole subject with Nick Carter this morning when this first came up. Uh, I sort of noted that this is a questionable subject and why? Because a lot of these Ethereum miners have very outdated equipment. And during the time of the merge, a lot of them spoke about how they're going to pivot to AI. They ended up only, like almost entirely pivoting to altcoin mining, such as ETC or Ravencoin, uh, because a lot of this equipment is not able to do high performance compute. It's, it's old, it's slow, it's dusty. It's just like old stuff. Uh, but if you are successfully able to purchase new equipment, then it can be a home run. So great conversation here really quickly. Nick Carter tweeting back. Yeah, most ETH miners weren't able to make the pivot because they had low quality AMDs, which aren't suitable for AI workloads, not to mention actually running inference or training has way higher infra and software requirements than just Ethereum mining. I tend to agree with him on that subject. Three more stories for today. We talk about Tether, which is now going to be mining Bitcoin in Uruguay, is according to the block. Tether made recent headlines when it said it's going to invest about 15% of its revenues into Bitcoin itself. This comes after Tether announced that's going to announce about 15% of its profits into Bitcoin. And now they are mining Bitcoin, quote, by harnessing the power of Bitcoin, Uruguay's renewable energy capabilities. Tether is leading the way in sustainable and responsible Bitcoin mining. That's, of course, from Paulo Aduano, CTO of Tether. Uh, our unwavering commitment to renewable energy ensures that every Bitcoin we mine leaves a minimal ecological footprint while upholding the security integrity of the Bitcoin network. I like the story because we're seeing sort of like this self-sustaining larger ecosystem where firms that are adjacent to Bitcoin or in Bitcoin itself are interested in mining and contributing back to the network. The fact that they also have a lot of capital and are able to pursue uh, sort of these like stranded energy sites or low cost hydro sites is also a, a net benefit. I think that kind of shows you where most Bitcoin miners will go in the future. If the smart money is going somewhere, it's a good bet to say yeah, it's probably where things are going in the future. Biden's 30% Bitcoin money tax scrapped in debt ceiling deal. This is according to The Street, according to Pierre Rochard of Riot Platforms and Ohio lawmaker Warren Davidson. The Dame tax, which was effectively a 30% tax on the revenues of Bitcoin mining, I believe, has been entirely shuttered. Uh, Dame, standing for Digital Asset Mining Energy Tax. Uh, the idea was basically we're going to tax these Bitcoin miners because they impose a lot of different harms on society that we're not able to measure correctly. And so they wanted to be able to tax them to push them out of the U.S. The Biden administration has not been a fan of Bitcoin mining. This was just another federal level attack on it. This was part of the debt ceiling conversation, which has been going on for the last two, three months, uh, sort of reaching a, a fever pitch over the last few weeks. This was thankfully moved out of the legislation. Who knows why? My understanding was it came forward from a smaller group under the executive administration. So that's likely why it wasn't really pushed into the end of this bill. Uh, but perhaps we will see it again in the future. Okay, we will leave that story there. And let's go to our last story for the day. We're going to go over to Ethereum land and talk about some proof of stake stuff. Uh, this is about the complex nature of proof of stake and how there can be so many different things that uh, are attack vectors for that you don't see happening when you're building a system like this. Uh, proof of stake has this one ability where you are able to build derivatives of the stake itself and those derivatives can exchange uh, on different markets for different values and those values can also accrue and form a cartel. The question here, this is from Ethereum uh, core contributor Danny Ryan, a key architect of Ethereum 2.0, talking about the risks of liquid staking derivatives or LSDs. 
Uh, liquid staking derivatives are basically a token that trades uh, on par or maybe a little bit higher or less than your stake that you've put into the Ethereum ecosystem. For the first part, why would you even want an LSD token? Well, for the first two years after Ethereum, after Ethereum moved over to proof of stake, you were not able to move out your tokens. They had to be locked in the staking contract, but people still wanted exposure and the ability to liquidate their holdings if necessary. Basically, if you want to cash out, uh, you want to figure out a way to do that. So people created tokens that represented that stake and there were some contracts associated with that. So it was safe for both sides and there was some like yields involved with it as well. The issue with this is that over time, a lot of these staking derivatives centralized into a few platforms, notably Lido. Lido got very big where it's close to 30% uh, plus of all stake uh, is on Lido itself and the people are using these LSD tokens in order to trade. The concern from the Ethereum core team is that if people continue to use Lido or another service provider and continue to centralize that stake, then you could have some cartels form around Ethereum and start to control some of the governance aspects of Ethereum. In this post, which is uh, pretty in-depth, but very interesting, you see that there's a few nuanced attacks that are included in here, inclu including one called the frog boil attack, where uh, the cartel is active and alive but most people in ethereum are not aware of it they slowly start making some changes to ethereum or like staking procedures without other people noticing it and then over time ethereum governance has completely captured so this is definitely a story to watch if you're in the proof of work camp because this is maybe something that is difficult to stop if you're in proof of stake uh, there's a lot of reasons that these LSD tokens would be centralized and why people would want a centralized version of it versus a decentralized version of it. And I think in this case, a lot of Ethereum developers have their work cut out for them. Okay, we will leave the news roundup there for this week. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, give a subscription to the show. Check us out on our YouTube platform or subscribe to our newsletter, Mining Memo. We'll be here again next week on Tuesday for an interview and the following Friday for another news roundup. Thanks.